Good evening and welcome to a special assignment. I'm Ashraf Garda. Tonight we bring you part two of Hit or Myth, in which producer Hazel Friedman reflects on 17 years of Pagad and its 2011 version. She does this by reinvestigating the spate of bombings during the late 1990s and early 2000s in Cape Town. And as you will see, her investigation provides more questions than answers. Between 1998 and the end of 2000, 24 bomb blasts rocked Cape Town, gripping the city in a vice of fear. Three died and hundreds were injured. No one claimed responsibility and no one was convicted. Haggard was blamed and declared a terrorist threat. Yet since the first bombs exploded, questions remain. Who was behind the bombings and why? contact this little girl has ever had with her father is through prison bars. She is the youngest daughter of Ibrahim Jenica, Paga G-Force member and convicted murderer. Jenica's mother-in-law, Labiba, explains the hardship her daughter has endured as a single parent. She couldn't manage alone with the kids then. I was also staying alone and so we just decided to move in with one another and up till today we're still together. In addition to her son-in-law, Ibrahim, Labiba's own son, Anis, is also behind bars for murder. And for her, Eid is a bitter, sweet day. He just turned 21 when he was arrested. On Eid day, he was 35 years. On weekends, she tries to alternate between visiting either her son or son-in-law. Anis has earned his master's degree in law. Ibrahim has several degrees. She insists prison has not broken either of them, despite the fact that Ibrahim spends 23 hours a day in solitary confinement. Their spirit is always so high, even Anissa's spirit. But all of them, they're so good and because they do something good inside. It's not to say they're just wasting their time in prison or whatever. Ibrahim Jenica is best remembered as one of the most feared members of Pagad and the mastermind behind two daring escapes from the Cape High Court, where he and other Pagad members were awaiting trial. We just heard people screaming and we looked up and we just saw guys running down and then we just heard shots and we all just left the store and everybody ran into the shop. That's all I can see. He was rearrested later that day. He faced 138 charges, including murders of gang leaders, attempted murders of police investigators, robberies of police stations, and assault dating back to 1998. He was finally convicted of murder, but Pagad protested his innocence. We know they are innocent. It comes to no surprise to us the fact that he was given 139, he was charged with 139 charges. It stands to reason that they will find him guilty of something or another, but we salute them because they're the only people, because they had the courage to stand up against gangsterism and drugs. By the end of 1997, Pagad's covert structures were allegedly implicated in over 200 acts of violence against suspected drug dealers and their property. The state couldn't afford to, not, to be seen to be not acting. Secondly, the violence was escalating. That was beyond a perception. We had 14 out of 21 supposedly um, big gang leaders killed, police officers assassinated at, 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 at intersections. We did have threats against senior academics. Then the spate of bombings, including Planet Hollywood, the waterfront and St. Elmo's. No one was convicted for these bombs, but what distinguished these bombings was the greater sophistication of the explosives. By September, Minister of Safety and Security Steve Tuete warned of the threat of a major bomb blast involving more powerful explosives including fertilizer and diesel bombs. Tuete said that the bombers were operating in cells of two or three, making it tough for security agents to infiltrate. Then there was the keg and swan bomb. 
On the 3rd of November 2000, at about 5 a.m., Senior Superintendent Mzwandide Petros receives information that Pagat's G-Force is moving in the direction of Tiger Valley with the aim of planting a bomb there. He follows the suspect's vehicle and passes the information to Director Boyson of the Crimes Against the State Unit. The suspected vehicle stops in Vili van School Avenue, near the corner of Edward and Oakdale Road, and Petros stops about 200 meters away. The passenger in the suspected vehicle gets out with a container in his hands. He moves in the direction of the Keg and Swan restaurant. Then the suspect returns without the container. Further on, the suspected vehicle is pulled over by members of SAPS and the occupants arrested. Petros returns to the scene and points out the place where the suspicious container, a flower pot, was placed. The bomb is defused. And we didn't describe, we would describe this, um, but to be this as a breakthrough for the South African police and the other security forces. Here you actually have an explosive device discovered not as a result of a public tipple, tipple or an ex accidental discovery, but as a result of a deliberate police operation. The investigation is hailed as a triumph, and Petros is its star witness. So why did this case never get to trial? We find out right after this. A breakthrough in the war against urban terrorism is how the Kegan Swan bomb investigation is described. The fact that they were able uh, to be on the scene before this particular explosion is an indication here yeah, that we have got a dedicated, committed, professional uh, a group of men and women who are not sleeping, uh, who are trying their level best to ensure that uh, the perpetrators of uh, this uh, violent crime here in the Western Cape is put to an end. The suspects, four Pagat members in their early 20s, are incarcerated for three years while awaiting trial. Senior Superintendent Petros goes on to receive 15,000 Rand and a merit award for his work. Yet, mysteriously, mere days before the trial in 2003, the case is squashed. Was it withdrawn because lack of evidence? Because people were lying? And in and, actual and fact, I don't even say lack of evidence, I would say because of no evidence at all. Because surely, even if there was some slight bit of evidence, you're going to go to trial. You're going to try your best to convict, and that was not the case. Um, it is clear that there is proof that uh, people were instructed to lie under oath in our trial. It is clear that the instruction came from Mr. Petros. There were clearly problems with the sworn affidavits made by the police. The first is by Senior Superintendent Foster, who claims he received a call from Director Boyson at 5.20 a.m., requesting men to be sent not to the place where Petros allegedly saw the bomb being planted, but to a different location. Then, Boyson says he received information from Petros at 5.20 a.m., instructing him to go to Durban Avenue, not the location where the bomb was found. He then says the bomb was found on the corner of Oakdale and Edward Streets, and that it smelt strongly of diesel. Then, there's the affidavit by Inspector Badenhorst, the man who actually found the bomb. At 5.50 a.m., he was instructed to go to Durban Road. After searching fruitlessly, he eventually found the very conspicuous flower pot outside the keg and swan. It had red wires sticking out and the ground had clearly been disturbed. Sniffer dogs were unable to detect the bomb, so the bomb squad was called. And this was at 6.50 a.m., more than an hour after Petros saw the suspects plant the bomb. One of the investigators approached the prosecuting authorities with the following rather strange comment. He said, do you want the truth or do you want the official version? Now, generally speaking, there should not be any difference between the truth and the official version. 
Dr. David Klatso is South Africa's foremost independent forensic scientist. He was approached by senior advocate Paul Hoffman from the Institute for Accountability to investigate some of the anomalies of the Keg and Swan case. We started to scratch and we started to dig and we asked questions and we wrote letters and when was this initially? that would have been about 2007, 2008 I would think. The investigation was extraordinarily inept. There were all sorts of discrepancies. For instance, Petros claimed to have seen the suspects plant the bomb, in inverted commas. Our investigations indicated to us that he couldn't, from the position he described himself as having been at, have possibly seen that. Secondly, if he had seen them plant the device outside the keg and swan, why then were the police officers sent all over the place anywhere but the keg and swan to search for it? The third thing is that when the vehicle was examined for traces, forensic traces of either the ammonium nitrate, the fertilizer, or the dieseline which would have completed the explosive device, nothing was found in the car. Was diesel found on the device itself? The, the device was swimming in diesel. So that makes it very suspicious and strange that no traces of dieselene were found in the vehicle itself. The NPA prosecutor, Eunice van Veek, also realized there was something seriously amiss. She realized that the Kegan Swan case did not gel. She looked at the statements of the eyewitness policemen and she compared them with the statements of the forensic investigators in the matter and she saw that one and one does not add up to three. And of course the irony of all of this was that it would, it would appear that Petros was not even there doing the thing as he, doing the investigation as he claimed to have been done and yet he awarded himself uh, a substantial financial reward uh, and a medal. So uh, that that bodes ill having him even senior and further up the list of police officers if that's the kind of behavior he indulges in. There's no such thing as noble corruption in the, in the legal sense. Uh, corruption is corruption. Whether you're doing it for noble or ignoble motives, it is still a crime. Senior Superintendent Petros was subsequently promoted to Western Cape Police Commissioner before being transferred to Gauteng as Police Commissioner for that province. What was happening at that time, because of the turf war between the police, the Scorpions and the NIA, you had a situation arising in which it was necessary to, to have show trials and it was necessary to be seen to, to be... Uh, succeeding. And that kind of uh, pressure uh, put, puts incredible temptation on uh, prosecuting or, or even policing authorities, even more so, to, to produce a win, to collect a medal, to get a reward, to, to be seen in front of the television cameras, to be doing the right thing. Pagad's militant image and its covert paramilitary G-force made it a suitable suspect. Refrain from using the word vigilantes on Pagad. I was basically well, involved uh, uh, with the leadership of Pagad from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, what we must know from the beginning, Pagad was not structured as a radical organization with a view to commit urban terrorism. Radical groups infiltrated, associated with Qibla, uh, creating the impression that they are busy with a jihad, a holy war. Uh, and, and later on, it became a public opinion, basically, that Pagat is an extremist Muslim radical organization. And that wasn't the case from the very beginning. Members of Qibla was involved with the Pagan movement since it started. Members of, of different organizations, MJC, or Iksa, or Shurao, 
members of, of political parties or so-called political parties or members of that belong to the ANC or the PAC or ZAPU yesterday, they were all part of the program of PAGET. And to be fair and honest and, and to, be, to be fair on all these members that are still supporting the program of PAGET, this is what, how the program started. What we can say is that the question around Qibla, what is the influence? PAGET makes their own decision. By 2000, the United States had declared PAGAD a global terrorist threat, but a confidential document by the National Intelligence Agency shows that in fact PAGAD did not have organizational links with international Islamic militants. PAGAD became demonized. In the post-94 climate, both globally and locally, in which PAGAD emerged, two things stand out. One is the emergence of the global war on terror, and specifically the shift from the threat, the red threat of communism to the green threat of Islamic, so-called Islamic fundamentalists. That was happening globally. S South Africa also was emerging into the global market, both politically, socially and economically, and wanted to see how it could reconcile its own interests with that of the interest of the global West, so to speak. Coming up next, the man who found the bomb speaks out. Eleven Pagat members remain behind bars and their leaders consistently proclaim their innocence. Let me just um, put the record straight. Pagat's policy, aim and objective has never been to be violent. It is not our policy. We don't instruct anybody to be violent. Whenever there was violent incident, it wasn't from our behalf. Those bombings were done by professional people. Uh, you know, they worked in cells, I can still remember. You know, so even the cells were not aware of one another. So you were supposed to, to collect the pipes. You have to take it to Y, and Y will do the following, and X will do the following, and they were not aware. So they did it in a very professional manner. And I think it was very difficult till today to prove anything in court and to link anything to a specific individual. A confidential document by the Investigating Directorate on Organized Crime reveals additional reasons for the lack of success, including too many dockets, ongoing violence, confusion of motives, a very ineffective SAPS and intelligence structure, ineffective surveillance, and a lack of cooperation between intelligence structures and investigative units. In the Kagan Swan case, for example, there were two separate surveillance operations underway, but each was unaware of the other. To say that there were duplicate teams investigating the same thing is always the recipe for a disaster, unless there is a good cooperation between them. And in this particular instance, there seemed not to be cooperation between them. The Scorpions were using their investigative and prosecutorial powers to... to uh, pursue a particular prosecution policy that was laid down by Lucy Piccoli. The National Intelligence Agency, as you say, and, under Barry Gilder, was looking after the security of the state, which is its job, and then the police, who felt that they were being upstaged by these white-collar glamour boys, tried to show that they too were able uh, to do the necessary. We know there's a, con there's a fight for, for control of information and agencies within this country. And they play one up against the other. And there is a fight with the old guards and the new guards. And they have their own, and they have their own agencies fighting one another. As a matter of fact, I can still recall the incident where in a police roadblock, some of the national intelligence people were arrested with explosives. Uh, you, you know, so the police service got hold of the information, they set up the roadblock, uh, and they waited for uh, their near colleagues to come through. That case involved Pagad Gauteng coordinator Ayok Mangali, who in fact was a national intelligence informer who had infiltrated Pagad. 
His spy handler, Greta Bezadenhout, testified during his trial, and his four accomplices, former policemen, implicated a senior Western Cape police officer in the transportation of government-issued explosives from Gauteng to Cape Town. They were sentenced to eight years. And adding more spin to the complex web of turf wars was slain organized crime boss, the late Cyril Beaker, who through his Moroccan gang wreaked his own brand of terror on Cape Town's nightlife, while being cozy with both the old and new guard, as well as gangsters like Rashid Stahi. We will probably never get to the truth of who was behind many of the bombings, but one fact is evident. Cases such as the Kagan Swan and possibly others were tainted. Without knowing that there was no case, people said, well, we can rest in peace now. They've arrested the bombers. I mean, those were statements that were made. Now, if you, the layman, picks up these things, you're going to say, well, it's probably them. The police are not going to make a mistake. And yet they did. We requested an interview with Commissioner Petros and head of the Hawks, Anwar Dramat, who was involved in the Keg and Swan investigation and also received a reward. We also approached the National Prosecuting Authority. Our requests were either ignored or declined. But we did succeed in tracking down the police officer who found the bomb and he agreed to go on record. I started searching, I found the suspicious looking flower pot with Afrikaner keys and uh, I called a guy from the dog unit his dog came but didn't give a positive response I then called for the bomb squad that was just up the road and they came down and uh, deactivated the, the pipe bomb we started our statements and director Boyson um, said that um, we m I must write that I received information from my commanding officer, Superintendent Forster, uh, that they received information of where the uh, bomb was planted and where I must go and search, which wasn't true. Um, they told us it would make the, the case stronger of the state against the uh, Pagat members. It, it bothered me a lot, and that's why I had to to let the truth come out. Um, why must people that, I don't know if they were guilty or not, it had to be proven, but if you haven't got anything to prove it, why must they sit in, in jail? Why must you lie about the case to get them convicted? The message is clear, and we say this to everybody, be it a judge or prosecutor or an attorney. They need to ascertain the truth, and that is why they are there, to execute what is the truth. This is what we are asking. There's always a statute of limitations and secrecy. These things do come up, um, and at the time that they do, we have to cough up, own up, and accept responsibility for, for, for what we did. I wonder what your thoughts on Pagad are now. And you can give us your views on this issue on Facebook, Twitter, as well as email. And I'll be continuing this discussion on my radio show, that's SAFM's Afternoon Talk, Friday at 2 p.m. Now, to comments from last week's show that I've picked out, Elizabeth Bloom wrote on Facebook, Pagad should also open a branch in El Dorado Park and surrounding areas because the SAPS are failing our drug-infested communities. And uh, Tokozani Ways wrote, Pagad is undermining our justice system. They should report criminals to the authorities and produce evidence if they can. Well, before I leave, a pat on the back for Asanda Magaka and uh, God knows Nari for winning a Vodacom Regional Award for their story, No Woman's Land. And also for producer Hazel Friedman for being shortlisted for the AIB Awards for her story, Thagocracy. So that's it for tonight. Join us again next week for another edition of Special Assignment when we point out the issues that matter. Mm -hmm.